Hi, I'm Roger McFarlane. I'm a professor in classical studies at Brigham Young University. And it's been a real honor to be associated with this, uh, with this fantastic show. IMG and the Leonardo uh, have teamed up together to uh, bring these fantastic artifacts to Utah. And it's been really exciting since the beginning of our uh, understanding that this was coming uh, uh, to be associated with this show. And it's thrilling to be standing here in front of this old floor mosaic uh, with the Gorgon's head on it, um, probably scaring off uh, people who would, who would be entering uh, without permission. Her spooky eyes are uh, there in a sort of apotropaic effect, scaring away unwelcome enters, uh, entrance into this building. Uh, the topic of this talk is uh, what I call the last days of Pompeii, reception history and overview. It's certainly not every manifestation of the theme of the last days of Pompeii. Uh, from the time of Edward Bulwer-Lytton in the 19th century up until today, there, because there are many, many dozens, scores, maybe hundreds, but we'll be looking at uh, a few of the highlights of, of the reception of that theme um, as it's gone forward. The point I want to get to uh, at the end of this lecture, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it occasionally as we go forward, um, is that we are making a mistake if we assume that the inhabitants of Pompeii who perished in the eruption of 79 AD uh, when Vesuvius blew its top. We're making a mistake if we um, assume, in, in my opinion, that they had, they got what was coming to them. That's not always been the case. Uh, there have been uh, many discussions of uh, Vesuvius and uh, the destruction of Pompeii, Herculaneum, uh, discussions that have, uh, have taken this for granted that the people there who perished got what they deserved. Um, Let's take any case in point here. I'll introduce you to the, the house of the painters at work, the Casa dei Pittori al Lavoro, or this, this building is often called the Casa dei Castiamanti, the house of the chaste lovers, named after uh, the painting on the wall. I love naming the house the house of the painters at work because archaeologists have discovered in, in recent years that there was a remodeling project going on in this house really exactly at the moment that the volcano erupted, catching the work off guard. By that I mean not necessarily that the, the workers were there in the moment of the eruption, but they were certainly there on the day of the eruption. Um, their, their tools were left behind. There are little um, little temporary shelves that were put up against the wall, put onto the wall, mounted onto the wall, that held little uh, pots of paint uh, that the painters were using uh, on their work, painting the wall painting, the fresco, in this room uh, at the moment that the uh, volcano erupted. The place has been published, uh, has been studied, and has been understood. On my note here I say, the house was in the midst of major redecoration and remodeling. The scaffolding easels and paint pots were discovered in place. Something that's especially moving to me about this particular building or this particular house is out in back. There are some stables that were occupied uh, by three horses at least um, at the time of the eruption. And this slide shows I think in really moving detail, the skeletons of these horses that perished in this confined space as the ash fell from the sky down upon the inhabitants, the, the buildings, the work animals of Pompeii. These three horses perished apparently at three different times during the eruption and the ash was building up on the outside of the doors, pressing in, but there was no person there uh, to unbolt the door and lead the horses to safety. For whatever reason, the person was not there, and the horses perished, one after another. 
If you come to this fantastic exhibit, if you have come to this uh, fantastic exhibit at the Leonardo, uh, you'll be impressed, I'm sure, by the very last room in the exhibit with the plaster casts of human beings. Um, that's moving to me, to be sure. Um, to consider that, uh, that these are uh, remnants of individuals who, who perished in the eruption of the volcano. Um, but it wasn't just human beings who, who perished. We know a good deal about the eruption of Vesuvius. Um, geologists, that is volcanologists, uh, can tell us a lot about um, the phases of the eruption. Um, ancient historians got into uh, the game as well from the very beginning. Gaius Plinius Secundus was asked by his associate Cornelius Tacitus, the great Roman historian, Pliny uh, the Younger was asked by Suetonius to give some details of the death of Pliny's famous uncle. Pliny the Younger was famous in his own right. Pliny the Elder was famous not just for perishing in the eruption of Vesuvius, but he was uh, a learned and prolific writer. Uh, he was a, a, a statesman who had an administrative position of importance. He was the commander of the Roman fleet at Misenum, which is across the Bay of Naples uh, to the west from Vesuvius, Herculaneum, Pompeii. Misenum is, uh, was in antiquity the, uh, the seat, the, the port for the Roman fleet, uh, protecting Rome's interests. Rome is to the north of Naples by a couple of hours by car. Um, protecting Rome's interests to the south. And uh, the Bay of Naples forms a safe harbor, a large, large harbor for, um, uh, for ships and so forth. Pliny the Elder was the commander of the fleet and a very inquisitive man. He wrote um, nearly 40 books of uh, thinking on, on details of art and uh, artifacts and other details of the ancient world. Pliny the Elder was, uh, was a famous person. And according to Pliny the Younger, uh, his uncle was stirred, as everybody else surely was, uh, on this day in 79 AD to see a column of uh, ash and smoke uh, going vertically out of the cone of, uh, of the mountain across the bay. We know now that it was a volcano. Um, it was a pyramidal uh, mountain in the day of, uh, uh, of the Pliny's uh, in 79 AD. Uh, Pliny the Younger, in his letter to Tacitus, describes uh, that plume of smoke like a pine tree. This photograph of a Roman pine depicts pretty accurately probably what, uh, what Pliny saw. Column going straight up, maybe 20 miles high into the sky, very high, and then spreading out, fanning out at the top as gravity started taking over and, uh, and the column was slowing down and spreading out. Pliny the Elder, an inquisitive man of his nature, could not resist. Also, Pliny the Younger says that he was, he was moved uh, by the prospect of maybe saving some people. So he got in one of his fast triremes with the crew and took off into the teeth of the erupting volcano um, and uh, never returned. His body was found uh, on the beach at Stabiae, which is around a little bit south and west of Pompeii itself the next day. But details related to the eruption of Vesuvius are conveyed by Pliny the Younger in his account of the death of his famous uncle, uh, Pliny the Elder. That story uh, has legs. Uh, people have seem always to have been fascinated by uh, the eruption of Vesuvius. Um, in the 19th century, um, it really caught on. This sculpture, is a depiction of Randolph Rogers, Nydia, the blind girl of Pompeii. Nydia, the blind girl of Pompeii, with a stick to guide her steps, 
she's stepping around a fallen architectonic piece, a block of marble, maybe the top of a capital that's fallen to the ground. And since she is skilled at movement without eyesight, she's able to get out of the eruption and the story that's not told effectively in this sculpture is she's leading others to safety. Nydia is not a historical figure like Pliny, either the elder or the younger. Nydia is a fictional figure uh, invented by uh, the British novelist Edward Bulwer-Lytton. Edward Bulwer-Lytton um, uh, published The Last Days of Pompeii in 1834. Bulwer-Lytton is a name that lives in, in some infamy. Bulwer-Lytton, you may know, has given his name, well, he didn't give it, it's been taken uh, for the, the Bulwer-Lytton Prize, which is offered annually by some wags somewhere um, who try to come up with or try to find the worst opening sentence for a novel that was published in that year. Um, they do this because Edward Bulwer-Lytton, or they name the prize, I guess they do it because they're smart Alex, but they name it the Edward Bulwer-Lytton Prize because uh, Bulwer-Lytton is the novelist who's famous or infamous for that line, it was a dark and stormy night. Now, that line does not begin the last days of Pompeii, but Edward Bulwer-Lytton's Last Days of Pompeii is a novel that comes to grips with the eruption of Vesuvius and the devastation uh, to the culture and society of the people of Pompeii. A little clip that I've, that I've pulled out here, I'm going to read off the screen. In the chaotic darkness of the eruption, Nydia seeks Glaucus. Okay, you'll find a little bit about the character of Nydia, a little bit about the character of Glaucus, both inventions of, of Bulwer-Lytton for this novel. Again and again, she returned to the spot where they had been divided to find her companions gone, to seize every fugitive, to inquire of Glaucus, to be dashed aside in the impatience of distraction. Who in that hour spared one thought to his neighbor? Perhaps in scenes of universal horror, nothing is more horrid than the unnatural selfishness they engender. At length, it occurred to Nydia that as it had been resolved to seek the seashore for escape, her most probable chance of rejoining her companions would be to persevere in that direction. Guiding her steps then by the staff which she always carried, she continued with incredible dexterity to avoid the masses of ruin that encumbered the path, to thread the streets, and unerringly, so blessed now was that accustomed darkness, her blindness so afflicting in ordinary life, to take the nearest direction to the seaside. And in the process, Bulwer-Lytton has Nydia lead scores of Pompeians to safety. She's a compelling character, um, selflessly giving herself for uh, not only Glaucus, but the individuals who are going with her. This story that Edward Bulwer-Lytton created had legs of its own. Uh, nearly a hundred years later, as cinema was being developed, not only Italians, uh, but maybe initially Italians, turned to the story for, uh, uh, for cinematic material. The film, directed by Casarini, Gli Ultimi Giorni di Pompeii, has the noble Glaucus, shown in a still on the left, treating even the blind slave girl with respect. This is early in their involvement. When Nydia realizes that Glaucus is a noble figure, she starts to fall for him. But the problem with the novel, well, it's not a problem with the novel. The problem in the novel is that Glaucus really has eyes for the fair Ione, and she's shown on the right. Well. The reason why Nydia gives herself up in the end is because she sees that she'll never be able to get Glaucus. So I've, I've nearly spoiled the ending. I'll step back from that. She has plenty of bad examples in her society against which to compare the noble Glaucus. Noble Glaucus on the left in the same still, treating even the blind slave girl with respect. On the right, 
Arbaces, the corrupt high priest of Isis at Pompeii, is as dastardly as a human being can possibly get. Both men adore the fair Ione, and Glaucus would use persuasion to woo her, and Arbaces would use force and threats, as we see on uh, the center screen here. Arbaces is a curious character. I won't go into him in great detail, but I will say that Arbaces is really the first guy to get it, to, to be killed in the eruption of Vesuvius, um, as Casarini tells the story. In fact, as Edward Bulwer-Lytton tells the story, it's, the, um, it's Arbaces having been worked into a social and legal corner uh, from which he's not going to be able to get himself free that precipitates the eruption of the volcano. The way Bulwer-Lytton tells the story, the volcano is, is stirring, but nobody's mindful of, of the importance of that. Um, it's when the, uh, the pitch of Arbaque's wickedness reaches that level that the elements intervene and destroy the Pompeians. True love, in the end, in, in uh, Bulwer-Lytton's telling and in Casarini's adaptation of the novel, true love is saved by the volcano. Selfless love is manifest by the volcano as well. What I'm watching here is a red-tinted black and white film with chaos ensuing as the volcano has begun to erupt. And we're going to see shortly, there's Nydia leading Glaucus to, and Ione to safety. There's Arbaces intervening and taking Ione away. A little brouhaha breaks out. Glaucus throws Arbaces out of the way and escapes with Ione, and there Arbaces gets clobbered by a toppling column, which breaks over his back, I might add, which is pretty impressive in its own right. A glancing blow finishes Arbaces off. This story is told in that framing by Casarini, but it's, it's an adaptation of Edward Bulwer-Lytton's uh, account. This is a, a quote from uh, Bulwer-Lytton's uh, Last Days of Pompeii, pages 329 to 30 in uh, the edition that I have, the, 19, uh, the 1850 edition. Quote, as the crowd in the circus demands Arbaque's execution, he glanced his eyes over the rolling and rushing crowd. When right above them, through the wide chasm which had been left in the Velaria, the, the awning over the top of the circus, he beheld a strange and awful apparition. He, Arbaques, beheld, and his craft restored his courage. He stretched forth his right hand on high. Over his lofty brow and royal features, there came an expression of unutterable solemnity and command. Behold, he shouted with a voice of thunder, which stilled the roar of the crowd. Behold, how the gods protect the guiltless. The fires of the avenging Orcus burst forth against the false witness of my accusers. The eyes of the crowd followed the gesture of the Egyptian Arbaques and beheld with ineffable dismay a vast vapor shooting from the summit of Vesuvius in the form of a gigantic pine tree. Well, Arbaques misinterprets what's actually happening at the time. Bulwer-Lytton has arranged it so that an act of God occurs um, because the Pompeians are clearly steeped in wickedness. Nydia, the slave girl infatuated with, with Glaucus, complicates the plot by trying to win Glaucus's affection, thwarting the wicked corruption of Arbaques throughout the novel. The plot goes pretty much as you would expect. An opera of 1858, so a couple of decades after uh, Bulwer-Lytton's novel was published, called Ione, Ossia l'ultimo giorno di Pompeii, Ione, or Ossia, the last day of Pompeii, uh, by Erico Petrella, um, deals with Glaucus, a young Athenian of noble disposition, tempted by the example of his companions, young patricians of Pompeii, and so on and so forth. Um, 
This is evidence about two decades after the publication of the novel of Bulwer-Lytton's notion catching on. And the characters from the novel are showing up in this contemporary uh, opera. The end is pretty much the same. Um, from a summary of it, uh, of, the, of the opera, at the moment of Arbake's, of Arbake's death commenced the terrible phenomena of an eruption of Vesuvius. All is confusion and terror. Ione finds Glaucus in the crowd. Nydia reveals her love, but refuses to escape to the sea with the others, rushing back instead into the suffocating atmosphere of the city. Glaucus and Ione are seen last, making their way in safety to the shore, whence they sail off. A film in 1908, uh, created in 1908 uh, by Luigi Maggi, called Le Ultimi Giorni di Pompeii, diverges a little bit from uh, the Bulwer-Lytton, but it derives ultimately from Bulwer-Lytton, perhaps, I think, via intermediation of Petrella's Ione. Or this film from uh, 1925, directed by Anta Moro, La Fanciulla di Pompeii, diverges further from it, but it still pits Christianity versus the, the heathenism uh, and the depravity of Pompeii. I should have said that um, uh, Christianity uh, is introduced into the whole situation at Pompeii by Edward Bulwer-Lytton. Um, historically, uh, it's possible and perhaps likely, according to some, that there would have been uh, Christians in 79 AD in Pompeii. Um, but Bulwer-Lytton, when he explores the details of the Christian community and the expansion of, <coughs> of the Christian message at Pompeii, he's working primarily uh, from his own assumptions and not from archaeological evidence. But this film, uh, 1925, has a protagonist in contemporary Pompeii, so early 20th century Pompeii, projecting in dream sequences personal longing for ancient decadence. Um, oh, I wish I could be back then when they had all that great stuff. Um, but he transcends that in his conversion to Christianity, which occurs during the film. Uh, his beloved Rosalba, who also lives in contemporary Pompeii, regains her eyesight, um, which was once lost in a Vesuvian eruption. Uh, and all this speaks to the efficaciousness of the cult of the Santuario della Madonna del Rosario, which is the, uh, the chief church in, um, in central Pompeii, the city, the modern city. Um, diverging considerably from that, but maintaining the uh, title, Last Days of Pompeii, are a couple of other films. I haven't seen one of these. If you go on to IMDb, and enter in Last Days of Pompeii, you'll get, I think, 15 or 20 films uh, that show up. There's this one from 1975 called The Last Days of Pompeii. I couldn't figure out from IMDb who the actual director is, but the actresses, Ushi Degard and Candy Samples, seem to be adult uh, film stars, and therefore I've found this image here of the DVD in an unmarked label. 1959, Le Ultimi Giorni di Pompeii, starring the American muscle man Steve Reeves, deals with the topic of the last days of Pompeii from their advertisement, demobilized centurion, that is Reeves, heroic, returns home to find his father murdered by a gang of black hooded Christian robbers. Um, so this has the element of depravity uh, and the backdrop of the about to erupt volcano and the people who are going to be um, uh, destroyed when an act of nature occurs. Or is it an act of nature? I'm not really fond of the, of the film The Last Days of Pompeii, directed by Shodshak and Cooper in 1935. It's worth watching. 
but it strives to deal with the basic topic of the last days of Pompeii as originated by Bulwer-Lytton, but it diverges a bit. It has a much more consistent Christian message going through it. Preston Hale plays Marcus the gladiator who is up and coming and is making his way in society. And he makes some choices which lead to his rejection of the Christian message and also the near loss of his son. But in the end, well, you can kind of see it in this still. You can see a ghostly kind of shadowy figure reaching out the right hand to the recumbent Marcus the gladiator lying there in the falling ash during the eruption of Vesuvius. This man has just given his all so that in, in a Nydia sort of fashion so that others can go free and escape the, uh, the destruction of the volcano. But he's losing his life at this moment as he says, Master. The Vesuvian disaster undoes Marcus's world and the wicked who are with him. In 1935, the message I think is, is clear. Uh, materiality is not going to bring happiness um, the way more ethereal pursuits. True to form, this story, as told by Shochak and Cooper, has the volcano erupt at the moment that the inhabitants of Pompeii have gone too far. But here's this pompous entry uh, at the beginning of gladiatorial combat. There's Marcus encountering his son. Why didn't you send for me? You can't do anything for me, Father. I'll get you out. No, these men must die. It's the law of Rome that condemns them. It condemns this me This impasse too. between Goodbye, uh, no. misguided no father and converted Why son. This is a poor way to gain the favor of the people. I can't we came to see fighting. We want entertainment. Is Marcus trying to make a fool of him? He takes too much upon himself. Give the signal for the slaves to be driven out. Let the games begin. So in this critical moment, <laughs> which is going to uh, undo Marcus and his family. Young man there. He's no slave, really. Can I just cut to the end? Let's leave it as a cliffhanger. The volcano is about to erupt. As the volcano erupts, some people escape and some people don't. There's Marcus the gladiator about to throw himself against the might of the Roman military for the sake of those people who are getting on the last ship out of Pompeii. I think I've already spoiled the ending. I encourage you to watch it. Visitors to Pompeii now uh, are overwhelmed with, um, with the sights, the sounds, the crowds, the pressing crowds. This is not too far away from the house of the chaste lovers or the house of the, the painters at work. It's in the middle of Pompeii and it's the infamous house of the lupinar, the, the brothel. Those, the, the sex workers who were involved in this business, the Lupinar, were probably slaves and were uh, almost certainly working against their will in this place. And I don't want to sugarcoat that. But I included here a quote from Tacitus, again, the same uh, as the historian before. Well, no, this is not a quote from Tacitus. I'm, I'm referring to Tacitus on procedures for sex workers, civil registration, and so forth. This is a quote actually from uh, Richardson's Dictionary of Ancient Rome, the New Topographical Dictionary of Ancient Rome. Lupinarii, brothels, are listed in regionary catalogs in Rome's second region, the Caelamontium, usually presumed to be a zone where brothels were numerous and notorious. But from other sources, we learned that they were especially to be found in the center of Rome on the Sacra Via and the Sabura. My point in quoting this is that Rome and probably every other ancient city had brothels. Does it stand to reason that Pompeii would be destroyed because it had a feature, a social feature that other cities as well had? I think it doesn't. Um, in 1895, um, the Reverend Francis Clark wrote this, and I'm not blaming him especially, 
but it's the mindset. Referring to Pompeii, this ruined city, which was overwhelmed by the wrath of God in a single night, its polluted streets and houses, which even now indicate depths of depravity that have seldom been witnessed in the history of the world, ruined and utterly destroyed as habitations for the living. Surely the moralist will be excused for drawing his lesson from the destruction of this comparatively modern Sodom and Gomorrah. I think we shouldn't be so hasty in our judgment. In my opinion, Pompeii and Herculaneum went down because the volcano erupted. If there were documentary, and maybe this documentary evidence will come to light, uh, suggesting that the inhabitants were being warned by prophets of God, then I might change my mindset. Sodom and Gomorrah, according to biblical record, had warnings given to it. And that aligns a little more carefully with my personal beliefs. I don't know what, what you, the viewer, personally believe, and I'm not trying to sell this. I am trying to um, um, argue for a little more understanding regarding uh, the people of Pompeii. Marion C. Cooper's papers are archived at Brigham Young University's L. Tom Perry Special Collections in the Lee Library there. Interesting that there's a folder there containing documentation of an advertising campaign in 1935 uh, that accompanied the release of the Shodshak Cooper film, The Last Days of Pompeii. And we know that clergymen from all over the greater New York area were invited to a special screening of the film and invited to offer their opinions. One of them, one of the many that are in the Cooper papers there, states this. The film was excellent. I shall preach about it. I will recommend it everywhere I can. Because it delivers a message, the film delivers a message that's consistent with that particular um, man's mindset. Let me conclude with, um, with a quick summary of, of a novel uh, written, published in 2003 by Robert Harris called Pompeii. It's a great novel. I highly recommend it. It makes the same mistake, in my opinion, mistake, or let me say it more generously. It narrates the volcanic eruption of Vesuvius in much the same way as Edward Bulwer-Lytton does. There's this desire in Harris's account to include uh, scientific detail. For Harris, the scientific detail is, is geological, vulcanological. For Bulwer-Lytton, it was more uh, archaeological. But Harris begins, the very first words within the novel are a timestamp, 22 August, two days before the eruption, 0421 hours, so early in the morning. And we know already that there will be an eruption, and we're watching a ticking clock go. We're two days before the eruption. Robert Harris offers supporting volcanological evidence in chapter epilogues. For instance, there's this one, almost all very large historic eruptions have come from volcanoes that have been dormant for centuries. Okay, and he cites chapter and verse. Or, they left the aqueduct two hours before dawn. That's how the story actually gets going. Towards the end, after the bad guys have been introduced, the good guys have had their chance. Everything has happened uh, within the novel. We get to this point, and the worst guy, the leader of the, of the mafiosi in the narrative, gets killed most viciously, most uh, horribly, and first. An incandescent, this is quoting from Robert Harris, an incandescent sandstorm raced down the hill towards Ampliatus. Exposed walls sheared, roofs exploded, tiles and bricks, beams and stones and bodies flew at him, and yet so slowly. It seemed to him in that long moment before his death that he could see them turning against the brilliance, like the slow motion, the guy's going to get creamed here in a second, and then the blast hit him, burst his eardrums, ignited his hair, blew his clothes and shoes off, and whirled him upside down, slamming him against the side of a building. He died in the instant. The instant it took the surge to reach the baths and shoot through the open windows, choking his wife, 
who, obeying orders to the last, had remained in her place in the sweating room, it caught his son, and so forth. So this narrative goes the way narratives of the Vesuvian eruption tend to go. Um, the bad guys get it worst. The bad guys get it first. Um, and a few of the innocent, a few of the protagonists survive. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the last couple of slides I have here and encourage you, um, if you're following from home, um, to check out a couple of things that are available. Mary Beard and Paul Elston participated in the production of a special for BBC called Life and Death in a Roman Town. Mary Beard and Paul Elston helped tell the story well. Mary Beard also, in a book published in 2010, The Fires of Vesuvius, Pompeii Lost and Found, dwells appropriately more on the life of the Pompeians than on their death. Victoria C. Gardner Coates and others explored this side of reception of Pompeii in a museum exhibition that was at the Getty Villa in 2012 in Malibu, California. The title of the exhibition and the catalog, The Last Days of Pompeii, Decadence, Apocalypse, and Resurrection. Very interesting essays in that book. Also, for your consideration, Simon Goldhill's Victorian Culture and Classical Antiquity deals with the, the mindset of Bulwer-Lytton and the reception. Or I took a stab at it myself in a 2009 essay called Vesuvian Narratives, Collisions and Collusions of Man and Volcano. Be happy to uh, answer any questions if you write to mcfarlane at byu.edu. But once again, hats off to the, the Leonardo for bringing these artifacts um, from Pompeii, Herculaneum, from the feet of Vesuvius that help us understand the life of the people uh, who live there. And when it is time within this exhi exhibition to ponder the moment of death, it's done in an appropriate way. Thank you. <laughs>